Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2024 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of The Tragic Events in Chile, A Lesson for Revolutionaries of the Whole World by Enver Hoxha from 1973. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialism for all or buy me a coffee.com slash socialism for all. There are links to Patreon and buy me a coffee in the video description. So this piece was first published in Zuri y Popolit, October 2nd, 1973, and it was republished in December 2010 by the Communist International Stalinist Hojists. So next week on the channel, we're going to be starting a mini-series on first-wave anti-revisionism in the 1940s and 50s, which focused on the phenomenon known as Browderism, so called for the head of CPUSA at the time, Earl Browder. But before we get into that, this is our last sort of grab bag reading. I want to thank Flashy for bringing this one to my attention. People do ask about Allende in Chile in the 1970s, as it's one of the foremost examples of somewhat successful democratic socialism, if by somewhat successful you consider having your movement last only a few years and then get taken over by a fascist dictatorship. It's not that Marxist-Leninists don't want a peaceful transition to socialism. Absolutely. The problem is that the bourgeoisie has demonstrated time and again that they will not relinquish power peacefully. They will, in fact, unleash enormous amounts of violence on the population so that the means of production do not pass into the hands of the people. Marxist-Leninists noticing this account for it in our methods of organizing. Just recently, I had somebody in the comments commenting to a bunch of other commenters that, oh, actually, communism is right-wing, and the real left is socialist, and I'm a democratic socialist from England, and actually, we just want to do peaceful everything. Yeah, so do we. The problem is that doesn't actually work because the bourgeoisie brings the violence. In other words, oh, peaceful transition through parliament. Why did nobody think of that before? Well, of course someone thought of it before. It just doesn't work. Actually, there is a video on a channel that we link to in the channels tab, Marxism Today. The title of the video is Why Democratic Socialism Isn't Enough. It's a good under 20 minute explanation of the self-described democratic socialist tradition using historical examples from across the world. And of course, Allende's government is one of those examples. So a lot of the times in the imperialist countries, a democratic socialist regime will come into power, and then basically it'll just end up bolstering imperialism in some way while promising to divide the spoils of imperialism or the super profits more evenly to the proletariat of that country. That sort of anti-internationalist outlook, which seeks to buy off the proletariat of that country and get them disinterested in actual revolution and actual socialism, has been described as social chauvinism. Socialist in name, but actually chauvinistic in practice toward the bourgeois nation-state. And in non-imperialist countries, of course, it can't do this because those countries are not exploiting other countries through the imperialist system, which is a global system and the highest stage of capitalism with particular characteristics as described by Lenin. But it also doesn't really bring liberation to the people. Again, Allende. So as far as the author of this piece, Enver Hoxha, Enver Hoxha was the leader of the Party of Labor of Albania, an outspoken critic of modern revisionism after the Communist Party of the Soviet Union under Khrushchev started to embrace some of the more reformist parties of Europe and just generally taking more of a petty bourgeois revisionist line on a number of domestic and foreign questions, questions which many times had already been long settled within the communist movement, Albania went the way of the Communist Party of China, which was openly critical of this turn of the USSR. There was a period in the late 50s and 60s known as the Sino-Soviet split, in which China and the USSR split over, again, Soviet revisionism or modern revisionism. If you're interested in that, we have a number of readings on our Sino-Soviet split playlist here on the channel. That was another mini-series that we did recently. So in the following years, Hoja continued his anti-revisionist stance and continued to comment and criticize various other factions within the international communist movement. While Allende in Chile may not have been communist per se, this was allegedly a country that was going to be building socialism. Until it wasn't, thanks in large part to the U.S., Henry Kissinger had a huge hand in the counter-revolution, the coup d'etat that happened there. So this is the analysis, again, current from the time, 1973, from a leading anti-revisionist Marxist-Leninist, so let's get into it. 
In Chile, the counter-revolutionary storm continues to rage against the working masses, the patriots and fighters of that country. The rightist forces which seized power as a result of the September 11 coup d'etat have established a reign of terror which even the Hitlerites would have envied. People are being ruthlessly murdered and massacred everywhere, in the streets or at work, without trial and on any pretext. The sports stadiums have been transformed into concentration camps. Progressive culture is being trampled underfoot. Marxist books are being burned in bonfires in the squares, Nazi style. While the democratic parties, trade unions, and democratic organizations have been outlawed, medieval obscurantism is spreading over the whole country. The most fanatical, ultra-reactionary forces of darkness, the agents of American imperialism, are strutting on the political stage. The democratic freedoms which the people had won through struggle and bloodshed were wiped out within one day. The events in Chile affect not only the Chilean people, but all the revolutionary, progressive, and peace-loving forces of the world. Therefore, the revolutionaries and the working people, not only of Chile but of other countries, ought to draw conclusions from these events. Of course, we are not talking of an analysis of purely national details and aspects, or of specific actions, shortcomings, or mistakes of the Chilean revolution, which do not go beyond the internal framework of this revolution. We are speaking of those universal laws which no revolution can avoid, and which every revolution is obliged to apply. The problem is to examine and assess in the light of the events in Chile which views proved correct and which distorted on the issues of the theory and practice of the revolution, to verify which theses are revolutionary and which are opportunist, and to determine which attitudes and actions assist the revolution and which assist the counter-revolution. In the first place, it must be said that the period during which the Allende government remained in power is not a period which can be easily erased from the life of the Chilean people, or from the whole history of Latin America. Interpreting the demands and wishes of the broadest popular masses, the Popular Unity government adopted a series of measures and carried out a number of reforms which were intended to strengthen the national freedom and independence of the country and the independent development of its economy. The government struck heavy blows at the local oligarchy and the American monopolies which held all the key positions and were making the law in the country. The inspirer of this progressive and anti-imperialist course was President Allende, one of the noblest figures to emerge from Latin America, an outstanding patriot and democratic fighter. Under his leadership, the Chilean people struggled for the land reform, struggled for the nationalization of foreign companies struggled for the democratization of the life of the country and for the freedom of Chile from American influence. Allende strongly supported the anti-imperialist liberation movements in Latin America and made his country an asylum for all the freedom fighters persecuted by the thugs and military juntas of Latin America. He gave the people's liberation and anti-imperialist movements his unreserved support and was in full solidarity with the struggle of the Vietnamese, Cambodian, Palestinian, and other peoples. Could the big Chilean landowners, who saw their estates distributed to the poor peasants, forgive him for pursuing this course and this activity? Could the manufacturers of Santiago, who were expelled from their nationalized plants, tolerate this? Or the American companies which lost their power? It was certain that one day they would unite to overthrow him and regain their lost privileges. Here, a natural question arises. Was Allende aware of the atmosphere which surrounded him? Did he see the conspiracies being hatched up against him? Of course he did. Reaction operated openly. It assassinated cabinet ministers, functionaries of government parties, and rank-and-file officials. It instigated and directed the organization of the counter-revolutionary strikes of the truck drivers, merchants, doctors, and other petty bourgeois strata. Finally, it tried its strength in the military coup in June, which proved abortive. Several plans of the CIA for the overthrow of the lawful government were discovered. These attacks by internal and external reaction would have been sufficient to sound the alarm and make Allende reflect. They would have been ample reason to implement the great law of every revolution, that counter-revolutionary violence must be opposed with revolutionary violence. But President Allende did nothing, made no move. Certainly, he cannot be accused of lack of ideals. He loved the cause for which he fought with all his heart, and to the end, he believed in the justice of that cause. He did not lack personal courage and was ready to make, and did in fact make, the supreme sacrifice. But his tragedy was that he believed he could convince the reactionary forces through reason to give up their activity and relinquish their past positions and privileges of their own goodwill. 
and commenting, you can hear this if you listen to the audiobooks that we have of Allende on the channel where he's speaking to the government. He's telling them how they're going to transform everything and give it to the people. And you just have to wonder, all these reactionaries sitting there in the audience listening to this, literally plotting his death. I mean, what was Allende thinking? Well, continuing... In Chile, it was believed that the relatively long-established democratic traditions, parliament, the legal activity of political parties, the existence of a free press, etc., were an insurmountable obstacle to any reactionary force which might attempt to seize power by violence. The reality, however, proved the opposite. The coup d'etat of the rightist forces proved that the bourgeoisie will tolerate certain freedoms just so long as its essential interests are not affected. But when it sees that these interests are threatened, it is no longer concerned about ethics. The revolutionary and progressive forces in Chile have suffered a defeat. This is very serious, but temporary. A constitutional government may be overthrown, thousands of people may be killed, and scores of concentration camps set up. But the spirit of freedom, the people's spirit of revolt, can neither be killed nor imprisoned. The people are resisting, and this proves that the working masses are not reconciled to defeat that they're determined to draw conclusions from this and to advance on the revolutionary road. The liberation struggle against reaction and imperialism has its zigzags, its ups and downs. There is no doubt that the Chilean people, who have given so many proofs of their lofty patriotism, who have displayed such love for freedom and justice, and who hate imperialism and reaction so profoundly, will know how to mobilize their forces and fight the enemies blow for blow to ensure the final victory for themselves. For the Chilean people, this is a grave, although temporary, misfortune. But for the modern revisionists, it constitutes an all-around defeat, a complete overturning of their opportunist theories. All the revisionists, from those of Moscow to those of Italy, France, and elsewhere, presented the, quote, Chilean experience as a concrete example, which proved their, quote, new theories about the, quote, peaceful road of the revolution. The transition to socialism under the leadership of many parties, the moderation of the nature of imperialism, the dying out of the class struggle and the conditions of peaceful coexistence, etc. The revisionist press made great play with the Chilean road in order to advertise the opportunist theses of the 20th Congress of the CPSU and the reformist and utopian programs of the Toliatist type. From the Chilean experience, the revisionists expected not only confirmation of their theories about the parliamentary road, but also a, quote, classical example of the building of socialism under the leadership of a coalition of Marxist and capitalist parties. They expected confirmation of their thesis that the transition to socialism is possible through parliamentary elections without revolution. That socialism can be built not only without smashing the old state apparatus of the bourgeoisie, but even with its aid. Not only without establishing the revolutionary people's power, but by negating it. The theories of peaceful coexistence and the, quote, peaceful parliamentary road, propounded by the Soviet revisionists in the first place, and by the Italian and French revisionists and their other supporters, are responsible to a very considerable extent for the spread of pacifist illusions and opportunist stands toward the bourgeoisie and deviation from the revolutionary struggle. Quick comment here, the words opportunist and revisionist both have meanings in common English, but in Marxist jargon, revisionism refers to revising or departing from major theses of scientific socialism, such as the need for revolution, or that capitalism cannot last forever. And opportunism, in a Marxist sense, tends to mean class collaboration, so it's opportunist in that it's not standing just for proletarian interests, but working with forces that represent, for example, bourgeois interests, which are fundamentally opposed to proletarian interests. There have been some cases, for example, in certain national liberation struggles where capitalism was not well developed, where a proletarian-led political movement might work with some of the bourgeoisie to develop capitalism to a point where socialism can then be built. But these circumstances are really specific and limited. Everything else would tend to fall under the heading of opportunism. Continuing, all the programmatic documents which the Western revisionist parties have adopted since the 20th Congress of the CPSU absolutize the parliamentary road of transition from capitalism to socialism, while the non-peaceful road is definitely excluded. In practice, this has brought about that these parties have finally renounced the revolutionary struggle and strive for ordinary reforms of a narrow economic or administrative character. They have turned into bourgeois opposition parties 
and have offered to undertake the administration of the wealth of the bourgeoisie, just as the old social democratic parties have done hitherto. The Communist Party of Chile, which was one of the main forces of the Allende government, fervently adhered to the Khrushchevite theses of, quote, peaceful transition, both in theory and practice. Following instructions from Moscow, it claimed that the national bourgeoisie and imperialism had now been tamed, had become tolerant and reasonable. Staggering. And that in the new class conditions, allegedly created by the present-day world development, they were no longer able to go over to counter-revolution. Comment. So as we discussed extensively in the readings in the Sino-Soviet split playlist, this was one of the major points that had China, Albania, and other anti-revisionist parties just outraged with what the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was doing and saying. Okay, so there were a number of revolutions and about a third of the world population was living in a socialist country, but capitalism was still the dominant system, i.e. conditions hadn't changed that much as to enable this kind of peaceful transition and sort of neutralization of the, quote, reasonable, now they're reasonable, imperialists. So what was behind Khrushchev's, quote, rush to communism, where you're just sort of declaring, and they were declaring, literally, that the Soviet Union had just reached full communism already. Boom. It was done. And that actually the dictatorship of the proletariat was no longer needed. Now it could be a dictatorship of the whole people, and so on. I mean, this is not nitpicking to criticize things like that. These were outrageous travesties of Marxism. As in this case, that, you know, oh, it's okay, have a peaceful parliamentary road to initiating socialism and ending capitalism because the reactionaries can no longer actually do counter-revolution. Well, how did that actually work out? Continuing. However, as the case of Chile proved once again, these and similar theories make the working masses irresolute and disoriented. They weaken their revolutionary spirit, and they keep them immobilized in the face of the threats of the bourgeoisie. They paralyze the masses' capacity and make it impossible for them to carry out decisive revolutionary actions against the counter-revolutionary plans and actions of the bourgeoisie. Comment. So again, these sort of pacifist illusions about the nature of the now allegedly defanged bourgeoisie misleads the masses and causes them to underestimate the threat. You know, you can't just turn Jurassic Park into a petting zoo. Continuing, as the genuine Marxist-Leninist parties had predicted, and as time confirmed, the revisionists were against the revolution and aimed to turn the Soviet Union, as they did, into a capitalist country, from a base of the revolution into a base of counter-revolution. Comment, so you might be going, wait a minute, this is 1973, wasn't the USSR still a socialist country at this point? Well, Hoja saw it coming. Continuing, they worked for a very long time to sow confusion in the ranks of the revolutionaries and undermine the revolution. Everywhere and at every moment, they have acted to extinguish the flames of revolutionary battles and national liberation struggles. Although for demagogical purposes, they pretend to be for the revolution, with their views and activities, the revisionists try to nip it in the bud or sabotage it when it bursts out. Their deviation from Marxism-Leninism, their abandonment of the class interests of the proletariat, their betrayal of the cause of national liberation of the peoples has led the revisionists to the complete denial of the revolution. For them, the theory and practice of the revolution has been reduced to a few reformist demands, which can be met within the framework of the capitalist order without affecting its basis. The revisionists try to prove that the dividing line between the revolution and reforms has been wiped out, that in today's conditions of world development, there is no longer any need for a revolutionary overthrow because they allege, the present technical scientific revolution is doing away with the social class contradictions of bourgeois society, is allegedly a means for the integration of capitalism into socialism, a means to create a, quote, new society of prosperity for all. Thus, according to this confusing logic, one can no longer speak about exploiters and exploited. Hence, according to them, social revolution, the smashing of the bourgeois state machine and the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat become unnecessary. Under the mask of Leninism and its creative development, comment a certain amount of which is always expected in order to meet the challenges of any particular country, continuing, the revisionists aimed at world domination, turning themselves into social imperialists. They began with Khrushchevite peaceful coexistence, with peaceful competition, with, quote, a world without weapons and without wars, with the parliamentary road, etc., and ended up with the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union and the degeneration of socialism into social imperialism. 
Hence, they were against the revolution and the struggle of the peoples for liberation, and were against the communist parties which remained loyal to and defended Marxism-Leninism. In order to achieve their aims, especially the extinguishing of liberation struggles and revolutionary movements, the revisionists made the peaceful road the foundation of their, quote, theory. By revising the fundamental questions of Marxism, such as the theory of revolution, and propagating their opportunist theses, they wanted to convince the workers to give up their revolutionary class struggle, to submit to the bourgeoisie, and accept capitalist slavery. On the other hand, quote, peaceful coexistence, which the Soviet leaders proclaimed as the fundamental line of their foreign policy, and which they wanted to impose on the whole world communist and national liberation movement, was a complete strategic plan to reach a broad agreement with imperialism, to strangle the revolutionary movements, and to quell the liberation struggles, to preserve and extend their spheres of influence. The revisionists wanted to use, and did in fact use, this kind of coexistence, which was entirely suitable to imperialism and the bourgeoisie, as a great diversion to disarm the masses ideologically and politically, to blunt their revolutionary vigilance and immobilize them, to leave them defenseless in face of future attacks of the imperialists and social imperialists. The Soviet revisionists, as well as the other revisionists who managed to usurp state power, destroyed the party by stripping it of its revolutionary theory rejected and trampled underfoot all the Leninist norms, and paved the way to liberalism and degeneration in the country. In spreading their anti-Marxist theses that, quote, capitalism is being integrated into socialism, that, quote, non-proletarian parties, too, can be the bearers of the ideals of socialism and the leaders of the struggle for socialism, that, quote, even those countries where the national bourgeoisie is in power are moving towards socialism, the revisionists not only aimed to deny the theory of the vanguard party of the working class, but also wanted to leave the working class without leadership in the face of the organized attacks of the bourgeoisie and reaction. History has proved, and the events in Chile, where it was not yet a question of socialism but of a democratic regime, again made clear that the establishment of socialism through the parliamentary road is utterly impossible. In the first place, it must be said that up till now, it has never happened that the bourgeoisie has allowed the communists to win a majority in parliament and form their own government. Even in the occasional instance where the communists and their allies have managed to ensure a balance in their favor in parliament and enter the government, this has not led to any change in the bourgeois character of the parliament or the government, and their action has never gone so far as to smash the old state machine and establish a new one. In the conditions when the bourgeoisie controls the bureaucratic administrative apparatus, securing a parliamentary majority that would change the destiny of the country is not only impossible, but also unreliable. The main parts of the bourgeois state machine are the political and economic power and the armed forces. As long as these forces remain intact, i.e. as long as they have not been dissolved and new forces created in their stead, as long as the old apparatus of the police the secret intelligence services, etc., is retained, there is no guarantee that a parliament or democratic government will be able to last long. Not only the case of Chile, but many others have proved that the counter-revolutionary coups d'etat have been carried out precisely by the armed forces commanded by the bourgeoisie. The Khrushchevite revisionists have deliberately created great confusion concerning Lenin's very clear and precise theses on the participation of communists in the bourgeois parliament, and on the seizure of state power from the bourgeoisie. It is known that Lenin did not deny the participation of the communists in the bourgeois parliament at certain moments, but he considered this participation only as a tribune to defend the interests of the working class, to expose the bourgeoisie and its state power, to force the bourgeoisie to take some measure in favor of the working people. At the same time, however, Lenin warned that while fighting to make use of parliament in the interests of the working class, one should guard against the creation of parliamentary illusions, the fraud of bourgeois parliamentarianism. Quoting Lenin, participation in the bourgeois parliament is necessary for the party of the revolutionary proletariat to enlighten the masses, enlightenment which is achieved through elections and the struggle of the parties in the parliament. But to limit the class struggle to the struggle within the parliament, or to consider this parliamentary struggle as the ultimate or decisive form to which all other forms of struggle are subordinate, means in fact to go over to the side of the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. Unquote. And commenting, I've often summed this up as saying that when you're doing a workers' party of any kind, particularly in the U.S., where the elections are not exactly favorable for anyone that isn't a Democrat or Republican or, in certain rare cases, a Libertarian, 
all neoliberal parties. Maybe 5 or 10% of your efforts should be in running candidates every two or four years or however, you know, at the local level, maybe every year or something like that. The other 90 to 95% of your activity should go into community organizing, doing actual things among the people that address people's concerns, agitating, educating, and organize in various working class communities. That is actually the priority for day-to-day -day action. Doing a Kyle Kalinske and putting your priority on just winning elections and then doing everything from that point is really not how proletarian parties gain power and popularity in the first place. You got to build that strength by making yourself actually useful to the working class communities in your area. Until people trust you because you've actually been of some use and you listen to them and you help them achieve their goals, you're just some other asshole with a slogan. Trying to get their money, trying to get their time, trying to get their attention, probably telling them a whole lot of lies, and haven't we all had enough of that? Continuing. Criticizing the, quote, parliamentary cretinism of the representatives of the Second International, who turned their parties into electoral parties, Lenin clearly showed where parliamentarianism leads to in ideology, policy, and practice. He stressed that, quote, the proletarian state, or the dictatorship of the proletariat, cannot replace it through its gradual withering away, but as a general rule, only through violent revolution, unquote. Lenin stressed that, quote, the need to systematically educate the masses with this idea, and precisely this idea of violent revolution, is the basis of the entire doctrine of Marx and Engels, unquote. By still advocating the, quote, parliamentary road, the modern revisionists are simply blindly following the course of Kautsky and company. Comment Kautsky was the opportunist leader of the Second Socialist International, who sold out the working classes of Europe by endorsing World War I. Lenin wrote extensively against Kautskyism, notably in the book The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. Renegade in the Marxist sense, referring to someone who used to be a good Marxist and then went rogue. Continuing, but the further they proceed on this course, the more they expose themselves and the more defeats they suffer. Comment until the, you could say, final defeat in the early 90s, which we still have not recovered from. Continuing, the whole history of the international communist and workers movement has proved that violent revolution, the smashing of the bourgeois state machine, and the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat constitute the universal law of proletarian revolution. Quoting Lenin again, the advance, that is, toward communism, runs through the dictatorship of the proletariat, and it cannot follow any other course, because there is no other class and no other way to smash the resistance of the capitalist exploiters, unquote. And to comment, if you're not familiar with the term dictatorship of the proletariat, right now in capitalism, we're in the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. In other words, one class rules society, and it sets up a government and other institutions which basically all revolve around the furtherance of that class's rule. And all of that collectively is referred to as the dictatorship of that class. So the goal of Marxist-Leninists is to replace the overall class rule by the capitalists with the overall class rule of the proletarians, or propertyless working people, people who do not make their living off of owning capital. And how do you get from here to there? Well, not via the parliamentary road, at least not for the final transition. Again, there can be times where communists can enter the parliament and do various things, but that is not really the bulk of the struggle against capitalism, nor can it actually end capitalism. See Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution for more elaboration on this topic. We have it here on the channel in audiobook plus discussion format. Continuing, in the stage of imperialism, both at its commencement and now too, the danger of the establishment of a fascist military dictatorship whenever the capitalist monopolies think that their interests are threatened always exists. Moreover, it has been proved, especially from the end of the Second World War to this day, that American imperialism, British imperialism, and others have gone to the assistance of the bourgeoisie of various countries to eliminate those governments or to suppress those revolutionary forces which, in one way or another, offer even the slightest threat to the foundations of the capitalist system. As long as imperialism exists, there still exists the basis and possibility for, and its unchangeable policy of, interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Counter-revolutionary plots, the overthrow of lawful governments, the liquidation of democratic and progressive forces, and the strangling of the revolution. It is American imperialism which props up the fascist regimes in Spain and Portugal, which incites the revival of German fascism and Japanese militarism, which supports the racist regimes of South Africa and Rhodesia. 
and keeps up the discrimination against the black people in its own country. It is American imperialism that helps the reactionary regimes of South Korea and the Saigon and Phnom Penh puppets, which has instigated the Zionist aggression and helps Israel to maintain its occupation of the Arab territories. All the furious winds of anti-communism, national oppression, and capitalist exploitation blow from the United States of America. Throughout Latin America, with some rare exceptions, American imperialism has established tyrannical fascist regimes, which mercilessly suppress and exploit the people. On that continent, all the weapons used against demonstrations, the weapons which kill the workers and peasants, are made in the United States and supplied by it. The fascist military coup in Chile is not the deed of local reaction alone, but also of imperialism. For three years on end, during the whole time President Allende was in power, the Chilean rightist forces were incited, organized, and encouraged in their counter-revolutionary activity by the United States. Chilean reaction and the American monopolies took revenge against President Allende for the progressive and anti-imperialist policy he followed. The undermining activity of the right-wing parties and all the reactionary forces, their acts of violence and terror, were closely coordinated with the pressures exerted from outside by the American monopolies, with the economic blockade and the political struggle the American government waged against Chile. Behind the military junta was the CIA, the same criminal hand that had carried out so many coups d'etat in Latin America, Indonesia, Iran, etc. The events in Chile once again revealed the true face of American imperialism. They proved once more that American imperialism remains a rabid enemy of all the peoples, a savage enemy of justice and progress, of struggles for freedom and independence, of the revolution and socialism. But the counter-revolution in Chile is a deed not only of the avowedly reactionary forces and the American imperialists. The Allende government was also sabotaged and savagely opposed by the Christian Democratic and other factions of the bourgeoisie, so-called radical democratic forces similar to those together with which the communist parties of Italy and France claim that they will advance to socialism through reforms and the peaceful parliamentary road. The Frey Party in Chile does not only bear, quote, intellectual responsibility, as some claim, because it refused to collaborate with the Allende government, or because it was lacking in loyalty to the legal government. It bears responsibility also because it used all possible means to sabotage the normal activity of the government, because it united with the forces of the right to undermine the nationalized economy and to create confusion in the country, because it perpetrated a thousand and one acts of subversion. It fought to create that spiritual and political climate that was the prelude to the counter-revolution. The Soviet revisionists, too, were implicated in the events in Chile. A thousand threads linked the Soviet leaders in intrigues and plots with American imperialism. They did not intend or desire to help the Allende government when it was in power because this would have brought them into conflict and damaged their cordial relations with American imperialism. These stands of the Khrushchevite revisionists towards Chile and the theory of revolution had been confirmed before the Chilean events. They had been confirmed in the repeated tragic events in Iran, while the local reaction was killing and imprisoning hundreds and thousands of communists and progressive revolutionaries, the Soviet revisionists did not lift a finger, let alone sever diplomatic relations. These stands were confirmed in the shocking events in Indonesia, where about 500,000 communists and progressives were killed and massacred. Comment for more on this, read a recent book, I think from 2020, called The Jakarta Method. Continuing, once again, the Soviet revisionists did nothing took no action, and did not consider withdrawing their embassy from Jakarta. Footnote there, the Soviet revisionists expelled the correspondent of Harjan Rakjat, the organ of the Communist Party of Indonesia, from the Soviet Union, and welcomed the visit of Adam Malik, then foreign minister of the Indonesian fascist regime. They also continued to supply Soviet weapons to Indonesia. Back to the main text, these stands of the Soviet revisionists are not accidental. They testified to the existence of a secret collaboration with the American imperialists to sabotage the revolutionary movements and to put down the people's liberation struggles. This stand sheds light on the demagogic character of the much-publicized severance of diplomatic relations with Chile now. Such is the reality. The fine words about their alleged solidarity with the Chilean people, like all their other demagogic catch cries, are simply to deceive public opinion and to conceal their betrayal of the revolution and the people's liberation movements. The Soviet government severed diplomatic relations with Chile in order to exploit the opportunity to pose as a supporter of the victims of reaction, 
as if it is on the side of those who struggle for freedom and independence, and the revisionists are defenders of progressive regimes. The Soviet revisionists help any progressive regime just so long as this assists their imperialist interests, but they go no further. Indeed, they are not ashamed to maintain regular diplomatic ties with such a discredited and bankrupt regime as that of Lan Nol, while they keep silent about such a great liberation struggle as that of the Cambodian people. The events in Chile once again revealed all of the grave tragedy the peoples of Latin America are experiencing. Likewise, they brought to light again the shortcomings, limitations, and weaknesses of the revolution on that continent, the very great difficulties and hardships it is undergoing. But they provide a lesson not only for the revolutionaries of Latin America. All the revolutionaries of the world, all those who fight for national and social liberation against imperialist interference and violence, for democracy and the progress of mankind, should draw lessons from them. This includes the revolutionaries of the Soviet Union, who must rise against the revisionist rulers and overthrow them, along with all their opportunist and anti-Leninist theories. Likewise, the revolutionaries of Italy, France, and other developed capitalist countries ought to draw lessons from the Chilean events and fight revisionism resolutely, rejecting the reactionary theories of the, quote, peaceful parliamentary roads, which the Toleadists and the other revisionists propagate. We believe that the events in Chile, the fascist attack of reaction against the democratic victories of the Chilean people, the brutal interference of American imperialism and its support for the military junta, will encourage all the peoples of the world to be vigilant to resolutely reject the demagogic slogans of the imperialists, revisionists, and opportunists of every hue, and mobilize all their forces in courageous defense of their national freedom and independence, peace, and security. And that's the end of the audiobook. So I started out very skeptical of Hoja initially, but I found that the more I read, the more it made sense, and I really came to love it. Solid analysis from just 40 or 50 years ago in many cases, talking about political problems which still are active in the world or have active legacies like the destruction of the USSR and the return of Russia and all the former Soviet socialist republics to capitalism. Hoja also, as I mentioned, started out as a close ally of the Communist Party of China, but as China took the capitalist road after the death of Mao Zedong, Hoja was there to criticize it sharply from an actually Marxist-Leninist point of view. And these writings contain a number of lessons which many present-day Marxist-Leninists really still have yet to grapple with. All right, so on some of the overarching themes of this piece, the parliamentary approach and democratic socialism, as I mentioned in the intro, I think that for socialists in the U.S. and the U.K. in particular, where there has been a recent resurgence in the post-2008 environment, when more and more people have realized capitalism isn't delivering the goods, it's actually getting really unstable and horrible, and so they're looking to examples of socialism that they can adopt as their own politics. In that kind of environment, it's important to understand these things. It's really important to realize, in the U.S. in particular, that as far as the history of the international communist movement and all of the various debates and struggles and actual real-world experiments that there have been in the last 175 years, we're really kept in the dark about all that stuff. So you really got to take some time, and I'm talking like multiple years, to really immerse yourself in the study of this stuff, and then you will start going, oh, wow, they were having these same conversations a hundred years ago, because that's about how long the era of imperialism has been around a little bit over that. Lenin basically summed up imperialism as advanced monopoly capitalism. He gave some specific characteristics, but said, if you're to sum imperialism up in a nutshell, it is not the early stage of capitalism, which is ascending and overthrowing feudalism and introducing new democratic freedoms, constantly innovating due to competition and all of that kind of stuff. No, this is a moribund capitalism, which has evolved into highly advanced monopolies and basically reached its final form or its highest stage. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. It cannot go any further. It cannot introduce any new freedoms or historical progress or development. It can only oppress and exploit. And so Marxism-Leninism, as an updating of Marxism for the imperialist age, is Marxism in the era of imperialism and proletarian revolutions, which we are still in. In other words, imperialism is still the dominant mode on the planet, and proletarian revolutions suffered major setbacks a few decades ago, but that is still the next step for human progress. 
So yeah, about democratic socialism and the parliamentary struggle. I mean, I think that already in the USA, a lot of people already don't believe that you can do much with elections because really in this country, it is very, very rare to see, like I said before, anything but a Democrat or a Republican or in rare cases, a Libertarian or in extremely rare cases, a Green get into any kind of governmental seat. So going back to 2020, when we started doing this channel four years ago, Bernie Sanders was running for the second time in the Democratic Party presidential primary. Now, we had all been greatly disappointed by Bernie Sanders in 2016 when he rolled over for the Democratic Party machine that basically screwed everybody that was supporting Bernie and hoping for some actually progressive change after the fake progressive promise and sloganeering of Barack Obama. So a lot of the early base of this channel and I think of the U.S. left now in general, were people who saw what Bernie Sanders did in 2016 and 2020, and maybe Occupy Wall Street in 2011 and 2012 before that, and said, you know, let's go hook up with the international communist movement. Let's do some real left stuff. Learn about that, and learn how we can bring more of that to our movement, fighting against all the bourgeois ideas or capitalist ideas in the communist and workers' movements that have kind of totally polluted those and then introduce instead some actually time-tested proletarian ideas and fight for a proletarian economic, social, political program that actually represents the proletarian basket of class interests. So I mentioned fighting back against all the capitalist ideas that had infiltrated and saturated the workers' movement and left, such as it is in the United States. And so I gave a definition of revisionism in the Marxist sense earlier. Another way that you can talk about revisionism, yes, generally, it is revising major important ideas of scientific socialism, such as the need for social revolution rather than just mere reform. But what are these basic Marxist ideas being revised with or revised to? Well, they're being revised to bourgeois ideas. So another definition of revisionism is the entry of capitalist ideas or bourgeois ideology into the communist movement. Now, trying to articulate a proletarian ideology while the capitalist class is the dominant class in society, and they're using their media and spending billions of dollars a day to put out a capitalist point of view and capitalist ideology and the idea that there is no alternative, capitalism is the end of history, etc., socialism doesn't work, you've heard all of these things. Well, it's capitalist propaganda or the propagation of capitalist ideology. So trying to propagate rather proletarian ideology is difficult. It is a struggle, and it's going to be coming up constantly against the capitalist ideas with which it is fighting. So what can you do? Learn to recognize it. Learn about anti-revisionist struggles back to Lenin's time and even earlier and closer to the present, as in this piece. And when you hear people then in the left, in the communist movement or whatever, making similar arguments, taking similar positions, then you can go, oh, I've studied this, I've seen this before, this already happened in the history of the international communist movement, and it can be struck down and corrected more readily. So I mentioned earlier that there was somebody in the comments recently promoting democratic socialism against communism explicitly against communism. This was an anti-communist making these comments, saying that, oh, we can do things nonviolently, etc. I mean, Hoja directly addressed that in here. But I want to make the point also that this idea that you can just have radical social change without any kind of violence, well, even non-revolutionary change, such as has happened in the United States, you know, pick any kind of major social issue where people were demonstrating and striking and doing all kinds of things, it maybe didn't culminate in the revolutionary takeover of society by the working class, but there was some kind of major reform enacted. I mean, that's still good, and that struggle builds class consciousness. Again, in the end, you've still got to get rid of capitalism, but those struggles are going to be part of the process. But anyway, the point is, even those struggles, if you know anything about labor history and just the history of social movements, they're always violent. There's always massive police crackdowns and the Cold Wars of the 1920s. I mean, the entire war on drugs started in the 70s up to this day is basically just political violence, another form of the class struggle. In other words, you really can't avoid this even in non-revolutionary movements. All of the changes that have been won, more or less, there's been some level of violence in there. So again, when the capitalists really don't want to do something, they are more than happy to use violence really at the drop of a hat, especially in the United States. So this idea that just you know, the totally peaceful road is possible. 
no, it really isn't, even if you're not aiming for revolution. So I thought that that was worth mentioning. Anyway, in closing, we've been talking for a while, the last few months now in particular, about the increasing likelihood of another 2008-type global economic crash. And I wanted to mention that it was in the news just the other day that officially the UK and Japan have entered a recession. And of course, these are major players in the world imperialist system. Their economies are all interconnected and the US is likely to be close behind. I've been posting about this for some time in the community tab. And actually in the last time that I posted about the US about to enter a recession as there's many indicators of that, whether it's the inverted bond yield curve or all kinds of other indicators, people running out of cash and so on. There were commenters saying, oh, the U.S. isn't in recession. Actually, the economy is growing. Yes, officially, the U.S. economy is not in a recession and doing fine, but there are many signals that a recession is around the corner. So like you look at unemployment, for example, what happens with unemployment is it tends to spike really high then to decline, then to kind of plateau out, and then it spikes again as a recession comes up. Well, guess what it's doing right now? It is at the end of one of those lulls, one of those plateaus, and there's a whole host of indicators that it is about to shoot back up again, as again, the UK and Japan are already doing. So why do I mention this? Well, as socialists, as communists, as people on the left, we look to these events as breaking points for the system. Every time the capitalism has a major crisis, as it does periodically, it's the boom and bust cycle. It was observed back all the way in Marx and Engels time. Well, when that happens, people tend to notice. Workers get thrown out of work and people start going, hey, what's wrong with the system? And it's been getting especially bad lately. So capitalism went back on the menu as far as something that could be talked about. And I wanted to highlight something kind of fun here. There was a comrade who made an instance of GPT-4, which is trained on Marxist works like Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, etc. And they gave me the opportunity to use it. So I asked it, how are proletarian revolutions most likely to begin in imperialist countries such as the USA, France, the UK, and the other G7 countries? The answer, proletarian revolutions in imperialist countries such as the USA, France, the UK, and other G7 countries are fundamentally rooted in the contradictions inherent to the capitalist system. These contradictions, as outlined by Marx and further analyzed by Lenin, became exacerbated during the imperialist stage of capitalism. Here, we see an advanced decay of capitalism, where monopolies dominate. The export of capital becomes a primary concern, and the world is divided among imperialist powers. This stage of capitalism sets the stage for heightened class contradictions and thus lays the groundwork for proletarian revolutions. So, gave a number of things to be on the lookout for. One, exacerbation of class contradictions. Under imperialism, the exploitation of the working class intensifies. Wages are suppressed to maximize profits, and job security diminishes as capital seeks the highest returns, often through outsourcing and exploitation of cheaper labor markets. This creates fertile ground for revolutionary consciousness as the proletariat directly experiences the brunt of capitalist exploitation. 2. International Solidarity versus Imperialist War Lenin's theory of imperialism predicts that the inter-imperialist competitions can escalate into wars, as seen in the world wars. The proletariat must oppose these wars, recognizing them as imperialist and not in their interests to fight. Through this opposition, a strong sense of international solidarity among the working classes across countries can form, serving as a basis for a global proletarian movement. And comment, this is why we do not do lesser evilism in the emerging World War III. Number three. Economic crises as catalysts, and this is the one that I really want to highlight. Capitalism is prone to cyclical crises, as described by Marx in his analysis of the capitalist mode of production. These crises, marked by recessions or depressions, can dramatically worsen living conditions for the working class, increasing unemployment and poverty. Such conditions can act as catalysts for proletarian revolution as the failures of capitalism become undeniable. And so this is what I was saying about after 2008, you saw a huge growth of the left compared to what had existed before. And I think that in the coming crash of the next one to two or maybe three years, you're going to see another huge opportunity for it. There's going to be a lot of people asking questions and we've got to get to them with our actually factual answers before the fascists do. This is why we study. Number four, political organizing and revolutionary vanguard. Central to the Marxist-Leninist understanding of revolution is the role of the Communist Party as the vanguard of the proletariat. 
This organization is tasked with raising the class consciousness of the working class, unifying them under a revolutionary ideology, and organizing them to overthrow the bourgeoisie. The vanguard must be deeply connected to the masses, understand their needs and grievances, and be able to act decisively in moments of revolutionary potential. Now, as Hoja was discussing in this piece, the latter half of the 20th century saw the corruption and eventually basically complete defeat of the major communist parties of the world. So this is a part we kind of have to do over again. But they did it once, we can do it again. Number five, ideological struggle against revisionism. The ideological struggle is also a critical arena for preparing the grounds for proletarian revolution in imperialist countries. It is essential to combat revisionist interpretations of Marxism that seek to dilute its revolutionary essence. This includes fighting against the influence of social democracy, mere reformism, which seeks to reconcile class contradictions within the framework of capitalism. So in other words, it thinks that you can have a solution to the basic class contradiction of capital versus labor within a capitalist or capitalist-ruled order of society. Impossible. And asserting the necessity of a revolutionary rupture with capitalism. In conclusion, proletarian revolutions in imperialist countries are most likely to begin when the inherent contradictions of capitalism are brought to the fore through economic crises, intensified class struggle, and the unifying efforts of a Marxist-Leninist vanguard party. This process requires rigorous political and ideological preparation, it's one of the things we're trying to help people with here, as well as the development of a concrete analysis of the specific conditions within each imperialist country. The goal is to create a revolutionary movement capable of overthrowing capitalism and establishing socialism, thereby advancing toward a communist society. Communism itself, of course, being the theorized end state after the dictatorship of the proletariat has been established, capitalism has been outlawed, the bourgeoisie suppressed, and then eventually reintegrated into society as proletarians. Well, then, after capitalism has been extinguished globally and the entire world population proletarianized, then everyone has the same relationship to the means of production, which is to say the equipment of workplaces, including raw materials and everything involved in the production and provision of goods and services. And in other words, as class distinctions are over, so are class contradictions. This stage has never been reached yet, as the high water mark of 20th century socialism was, again, about a third of the planet was living in a socialist country at the peak, and then the defeat of that wave of socialism has not yet been overcome with a new wave. But that's where you and I come in. So, we're going to leave it there. What do you think? Leave a question or comment in the comment section below. We will continue the discussion in the comment section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons and Buy Me A Coffee supporters whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. Every donation is encouraging, they're also materially helpful, and they allow me to spend more time on this channel than I'd be able to do without them. So if you like this channel, thank me, but also thank a patron or Buy Me A Coffee supporter. We've been consistently doing lots of content on this channel for the last four years, and we plan to continue that with the help of all these supporters. Big thanks. Beyond that, engagement counts, so like, share, subscribe, comment, even if it's just thanks or good video or random letters or whatever, that helps to boost the video and the channel in the algorithm, making it more likely for other people to stumble across this content. The channel has been growing a lot from month to month, so thanks to everybody who has been engaging with it. And finally, you can agitate and educate pretty well online, but the real world is where the organizing happens, whether it's in your city or if you're in a more rural area, maybe your county or your state or your region or maybe even a national organization. You've got to get involved in your local left, whatever it is, and take these lessons there. Meet people, network, let them get to know you, get involved in the struggle wherever you can, and you may not be able to find things until you meet people, but they may know of things that are going on that you can't find on the internet that may be more word-of-mouth type things. But in the organizations, you know, fight against the mere reformism and push for actually Marxist positions, raising the bar, and becoming a more effective movement. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next video.